Well, you can cancel the countdown clock to an election. The Liberals and the NDP have reached an agreement on pharmacare legislation that will formally be unveiled next week. We've secured something really important, I'd say really historic for Canadians. We're really excited about this. We have legislation that clearly points to single payer, it references the Canada Health Act and the principles of the Canada Health Act, very much what we needed to get, so that's, that's secured. In mm -hmm. addition, we have a commitment to cover two classes of drugs in a single payer model. So proof of concept, we're actually delivering. This is well and above what we had in our agreement. So this is something that's gonna make a big difference in the lives of, of Canadians. The two classes of medication that are covered, contraceptives as well as diabetes medication. So all of this means the supply and confidence agreement can continue, while Jagmeet Singh hopes the promise of free contraception and diabetes medication will quicken the pulse of Canadian voters. So what do our party insiders think about that? Here with me tonight, Greg McEachern, a former Liberal ministerial staffer, Melanie Richet, former communications director for the NDP, and Fred Delory is a former conservative campaign manager. Happy Friday, gang, and a happy Friday to you, Mel, because Thanks. your crowd got what they have been, uh, I don't want to say huffing and puffing about, but there's yeah. been endless news conferences from Jagmeet Singh saying March 1 was a drop dead date and here he announces the deal a week early. Totally. What, what do you make of this today? Uh, a week early and exceeding actually what was supposed to be delivered by next week, right? So um, I think this is great news for people across the country um, and not only is it going to be the idea of Pharmacare and getting together the legislation to build Pharmacare, we actually have a commitment to start covering medication to start covering medication soon. So that um, is going to cover, you know, millions of Canadians across the country. Uh, that's good news for people. And it's it's a thing that Jigmeet can say, you know, New Democrats did and New Democrats did um, because they continue to push the government. I'll, I'll f you know, rewind a little bit to last December when um, these conversations were happening, medication coverage wasn't on the table. So the mm -hmm. fact that Jigmeet was able to exceed really what was in the supply and confidence agreement and get those medication coverages, um, he'll be able to go back to people in the riding and say, not only are we building towards Pharmacare, here's the first step and people are gonna get this coverage soon. So I think that's that's great news for people, but it's also great news for Jigmeet and the party. So, so a couple of things that I'd heard today yeah. is that uh, your point about when they didn't reach the agreement in December and they extended it, that's yeah. when they started talking about individual uh, medications yeah. to be covered. Totally. Uh, the NDP brought diabetes to the table, the Liberals brought the contraception to the table, that however it worked, they're all gonna try to take credit <laughs> for it and this sort of thing. But Greg, as, as the other half of this coalition, <laughs> Uh, what, 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 do you, what do you think of this today? It, 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 you know, I'm, I'm surprised that the party's being out pulling out fundraise found a way to keep this going. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you said uh, you want to rewind, Mel. I want to rewind to last week. Chicken Little here <laughs> said, Little. you said the sky was falling. Hey, it this was. deal wasn't going to happen. She was on vacation. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, this AI image of you was, <laughs> that was very concerned. Um, but, uh, Chat MVP. <laughs> yeah. But, but, yeah, I, I'm, you know, on the Liberal side, we were hearing that things were fine, and and it kind of turns out to, uh, to be that maybe Mel was part of that, you know, offense <laughs> to ensure that it got, you know. I would say I was told the last 24 to 48 hours were super crucial, and I believe those people. So okay, I, <laughs> I I'm a little scared of you, so I'm you're in the power you have. Um, but on a more serious note, a few years ago, I worked for Diabetes Canada uh, yeah. it before it changed its name, and I can tell you this, although I'm not working for them now, diabetes is a very very expensive disease mm -hmm. uh, with all the health impacts and everything else mm -hmm. but just what families have to spend on it it is uh, just a, a, a huge burden so i think this will be good news for a lot of canadian families mm -hmm. fred how, how do you think this uh, plays politically because uh, you know dental was uh, fill in gaps right this is universal though it's got to be cost share with the provinces and they got to mm -hmm. sit down and negotiate those agreements right and that's going to be a heck of a, a, a tough haul for all for the future government to do this right because this is probably we're talking the next parliament when this comes in you don't think they'll push to get it done i think it'll be tough election? to get it done that quickly uh they can try but this is a complex this is a complex bill i can imagine that's going to be coming in but uh, you know before all this kudos to the ndp for doing this you mm. know we've we've we, i do think they were playing politics or felt like they were playing politics like greg said uh in the weeks leading up to this um but you know 
the liberals balked at it. They or they went with it. Sorry, they they you know it looked like they were going to renege on some points, and now the NDP got way more than they originally asked for. That that's a, a good win for them. Um, but you know how this is going to come in and how this is ever going to work. Will this ever actually see light of day? I think we're a long way before we get to that stage. Well, they may have been playing politics, as you always say. It's power and <laughs> politics, not right. politics and feelings, right? So, but Mel, like, do they need to get this done before the next election? Because I, I look at this that if they if if the Liberals and the NDP, sort of the progressive side of the, the equation here, at mm -hmm. least in English Canada, mm -hmm. wants the next election to be this choice mm -hmm. between what you get to keep versus what you could potentially lose. Right. They need this locked in Absolutely. with a bunch of provinces, Ontario, you know, Atlantic, totally. Quebec. Otherwise, uh, they, they don't have it as, as, a, as a leverage play, right? Totally, totally. But I think the, the nice thing for, uh, you know, the Liberals and the NDP is there are some provinces that will play ball on this, right? Like well, we've Manitoba seen, and BC right away. Exactly. Right? Yeah. BC is already committed to this. BC already has committed to some type of car pharmacare. We've got Manitoba, who mentioned it in their throne speech, that they were going to move ahead with birth control. So you have some provinces who have already signaled this, and they've signaled it because they know it's popular. They know it's something that uh, people are asking for and people need. So um, if they can you know, start with those provinces that they know they have common alignment on, hopefully um, other provinces will see the benefit and follow suit. But, but I do agree with you that uh, going into the next election, uh, the framework and these medications kind of needs to be live. They need to move on that quickly so that they can show people in a very real way, like they will be able to do with dental care, that this is what you get when you vote for us. Greg, do you think they have the runway for that? Because they, I, I feel for their, them politically, there would be an imperative to have this locked in so it's not just a promise you know, that has a bit, they need people getting the breaks on their diabetes medication, on their contraceptives. You know, uh, it, will the runway be there, do you think, to, to make, make this all happen? Well, federally, uh, most likely. And there's a lot of conversations around the deal and whether yeah. or not when when you know your previous panel talked about the divorce. <laughs> well, I don't think the NDP really want to go to the polls early. I know the Liberals probably feel the same way. Probably, so, yeah. you know. <laughs> I think the NDP probably want to wants to go them, faster yeah. than the Liberals do. Yeah. I'm not on a limb here, but yeah. if I was to give free advice to the NDP, is take the win yeah. Um, yeah. instead of trying to be, you know. Um, do this and then sounding like a, a, a less strident version of the conservative leader, the NDP, free advice, talk about how you're making parliament work and you're achieving results. Instead of this, when, when Singh comes out and, and attacks the prime minister, mm. he gets attacked right back, then why are you dealing with him? Instead, just take the win and say, look, we, we make parliament work. Well, you know, Freddie, he's onto something there that, you know, yeah. the stack up against the Canada is broken narrative that Canada is working and we're showing you how, right? right? That could be right. the counter to it. Uh, that's one of the issues with Singh is that he looks very hypocritical when one day he's working with the Liberals and getting something mm -hmm. that he wants done. The next day he's the big, uh, a big attack dog, uh, throwing pretty vicious punches at, at the Trudeau Liberals. Uh, he's got to pick a lane here. Well, what lane do the Conservatives have to pick on this? That, you know, can, can Pierre Polyev, his, his four priorities, one of them is fix the budget, which used to be balance the budget, but now it's fix the budget. Right, so I don't so. know what's going on there. <laughs> uh, but how, where does this fit into fixing the budget? You know, because like the Canada Child Benefit, uh, years back they had to say, we're going to keep it. Mm -hmm. uh, is this and that an took issue? a long time to get to that. Yeah, right? so, that so what easy. happens here? This blows up the whole plan on that. How do you how do you balance a budget or come close to it? This is a massive spend. Uh, so how this is going to fit? Where you know if if the conservative government is going to accept this and they've said no indication whether they they will or not, where. Mm -hmm where are the cuts going to have to come from somewhere else to get to this? Yeah, yeah, look, and it's not the full Cadillac uh, National Farm Care, which is like $40 billion a year, more than we spend on the military, so we'll, we'll find out what the dollar amount of this is uh, next week when we get uh, more official details. All right, Greg, I want to go to your pick. you got a misplay for us, and, and not surprisingly, you think the Conservatives did something wrong this week. <laughs> yeah, for weeks, my friend Fred has been talking about, you know, the commitment to the message and how, how strong the Conservative leader is on this, and he only talks about affordability. And this week, he got uh, way out on some other issues. Um, one of the ones that really concerned me was when he can, called the Prime Minister um, basically for most of his adult life had been a racist. Mm -hmm. um, and I know the Prime Minister has apologized for those photos. Um, we have run two elections since then, but you're still apparently allowed to lower the tone of the debate, which I find concerning. But then I think the reverse is, is true as well. Then people can turn around and attack the Conservative leader for the same. The day that Stephen Harper did the apology Pierre Poliver was on local radio here. For residential schools, you're talking For about. residential schools. Yeah. Was on local radio in Ottawa and said that residential school survivors should just get a better work ethic. And he had to, um, he, he had to apologize for that. So I think it's open season. If you want to keep doing that, you, you can't. 
He also took a question. We've, we've, I've heard this on, on this panel about he's good when he controls the, the media, but he took a question mm -hmm. from a rebel news reporter, same reporter that was kicked out of his deputy leader's event a couple of years ago. The question's about a minute long. It's a diatribe. It's very anti-trans. And the conservative leader weighs in on that. And all of a sudden, instead of talking about affordability, he's talking about bathrooms. Yeah. And 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 I, I don't think that this affects huge amounts of people, but it scares people, and and it's 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 really easy. And then on pornography, he gets out over his skis and he basically confirms that he's in favor of a digital ID, which should be just deet for their base. They quickly they, backtracked. They on that. backtracked yeah. it, but if you yeah. look at at you know what the options are. As I see it, it's either a digital ID or some sort of facial recognition, and I don't think it's very well thought out. So I think he, from a messaging perspective, had a truly, truly bad week. No, and, and liberals, Fred, are sending around memes all day about Pierre Polyev being anti-gun registry and pro-porn registry because of his answer the other day. I mean, it, it's silly, but, you know, it, it, it's social media stuff. But, you know, the, the, the conservative focus has, has been on two things, focusing on some core issues and softening his image. Mm. The issues Greg raised were neither of those. Right. Right? Uh, well, I'll be consistent and <laughs> keep yep. hammering that they, you know, conservatives do very well when they stick to their narrative. Mm. And when they go off that, uh, they get into these, the, they go into these pits that they don't need to be in. There's no votes there. Um, all we're doing is uh, fanning flames. Mm. And I believe strongly in 2019, uh, a part of the reason we lost that election was because we've got off message on blackface. Andrew Scheer had a message on affordability that was working during that election. Blackface happened, and the message track changed, and they tried to make the ballot question whether Justin Trudeau was racist. He's not. No one believes that. Mm -hmm. um, he's done some stupid stuff in his past, but he's not racist. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you try to make that the ballot question, when people think, is he racist or not, well, mm -hmm. you, you, lose, you lose the plot. And that's where the Conservatives went off the rails in 19, and that's where they need to be careful uh, running up to this election. They have a good narrative. It's working. They're 20 yeah. points up because they're hammering on that. They need to keep hammering on Yeah, I, I was assigned to cover the Liberal campaign when that happened. We were driving from Truro to Halifax the, before the campaign flew to Winnipeg, and Mel, I thought the whole election was over, done, there's no way you come back from this, and found a way to do it m partly through the response in the park in, in Winnipeg the next day. Mm -hmm. So, like, it is on the record. It is part of the Prime Minister's record. Yep. He's run two elections with it. It's just... Polly have brought it up when he was asked a question about online harms legislation mm -hmm. and, and a criminal code amendment to hate speech, and mm -hmm. he went there, mm -hmm. and, and it seemed... Really aggressive, right? And and not only was it off message, but but I th I think this is what we continue to see um, with Pierre Poilievre is he can't help himself sometimes to take those cheap shots, or he can't help himself sometimes to go somewhere that maybe is like a little bit disconnected from the conversation to to. Yeah, basically take a shot. And and not that those things are not fair thing to talk about and to address and to say, you know, this was bad. But it, he does it in a way that is mean-spirited. And, and I'll go back to your point about, um, you know, mentioning uh, what liberals or what conservatives need to do. And you said, you know, people don't inherently believe that Justin Trudeau's uh, a racist. And, you know, folks like us, we look at polling, we look at focus groups all the time. And what we know about you know, what people believe of the different parties is they think the liberals are sometimes disconnected. They don't yeah. understand what they're going through. So as long as you stick to that, they don't understand what you're going through. They're disconnected. They just don't get, you yeah. know, the hard times that too you're going preachy, through. all of these Exactly. Of they, that, that they believe. They don't believe that going too far. But what people do believe about conservatives inherently, or that's always kind of at the back of their minds, is sometimes they think they're mean. Um, so when that's the assumption that some people have, it is important actually to soften the image. It is important to be in touch with, you know, what people think about this conversation. That's a difficult conversation to have, but mm -hmm. when you are out there and you're standing and you're pushing a message that's anti-trans and you're kind of taking shots in other places, that um, feeling that people have comes to the front. So it's it's off message, and I think it's it's also not going to help Pierre Polyev in the long run. Okay, I, I want to get the Fred's pick, and, and we're going to have to introduce uh, our audience, I think, to to, to the, the person he's picking. It's Brendan McGuire. Uh, he's he's a Nova Scotia MLA who crossed the floor from the opposition Liberals to join Premier Tim Eusen's not only his Conservative caucus but his Conservative cabinet. Have a listen to this. And this is a Premier that's getting things done. This is a Premier that's working hard for this province, um, and. DCS and community service is something that's near and dear in my heart. It impacts my community. It impacts a lot of Nova Scotians' communities. And it's an opportunity to put Nova Scotians ahead of my career. 
So Freddie's putting Nova Scotians ahead of his career by accepting a cabinet post. It's an interesting, <laughs> but, but this is a, this is a big move. Uh, explain explain it to the national audience. It certainly is. Uh, you know, Tim Houston has a, the largest conservative majority that uh, that I've seen in my lifetime in in Nova Scotia. It's not like he needed uh, to bring in members. Uh, Brendan McGuire, though, is a, a, was a rising star in the Liberal Caucus. Someone who I had heard could have been a, a potential future leader of that party. Uh, so him joining is a big deal. But his personal story is what I find fascinating. He was four years old when he and his siblings were abandoned at a mall. And he grew up in foster care, uh, living through the community services uh, department uh, in terms of the impact on his life. And yesterday he became minister of that department. Mm. Tim Houston's looking at, you know, uh, moving fast and fixing and building up Nova Scotia. And uh, we're seeing people hurting across this country. And he saw uh, a great uh, member of the legislature who could help uh, move forward with that. So I thought this was a, a really uh, a great pick by, uh, by Premier Houston to do this. Greg, you were just in Nova Scotia. You couldn't stop the floor crossing when you were able to, to avert it? Uh, you know, I don't know, Brendan. I, I had heard uh, under Stephen McNeil he was not happy. I know a lot of my Liberal friends are not surprised by this. I look at floor crossings in each individual case. I worked for Belinda Stronach as a liberal. Um, yep. you could, it was telegraphed that she was unhappy she was coming. When Eve Adams joined the Liberals, I didn't think it was much of an addition. Um, but there's another story um, that's not being told here, and, and that's the, the minister who stepped down, Trevor Boudreaux, who I do know, yep. um, although he's uh, from the Progressive Conservative Party. He's a politician from the area I grew up. He's a really good guy. He had a tough portfolio. It's been very tough in Nova Scotia around the homelessness issue, a bunch of different issues. Yeah. And he stood he, he stood down because of his health, which is I think is a good choice. But I also note it's the same week that the mayor of Gatineau stepped down. Mm -hmm. And politics can be very tough and challenging for people, and I think we need to always keep that in mind. I find the life of covering politics very difficult, Mel. Just uh, and uh, I'm a guy, and I'm not elected. You know, uh, women have it far worse, and the elected officials in this country have it far worse. Mm -hmm. and, and it, you know, you, you don't know why people cross floors mm -hmm. to do what they do, but mm -hmm. you understand why some people leave mm -hmm. because of, of mm -hmm. that pain and pressure. Mm -hmm. Totally, um, you see it more and more, and um, people. You know, we saw a story this week about how more and more elected people have security around them because yeah. of those exact. Thing. Yep. So it's it's definitely scary and tough, and, and hopefully people are taking care of themselves in a way that they can. Um, and I'll just go back to the, this personal story and the fact that he's now become a minister. Um, the more people in politics that we can have who've had those experiences yeah. and can shape those politics, um, yeah. the better. So I think that that's a, a really great story. Yeah, th th there's no teacher like experience, right? And lived experience can form really good policy. Uh, mm -hmm. Gang, uh, really good conversation as always. Uh, great way to end the week. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Greg McEachern, Melanie Richet, Fred Delory.